Hey, I'm Dan from MapTech, and today we're gonna to take a look at how to use the new Create Drill Holes tool in Vulkan to create a life of mine conceptual drill design. Now, at the end of my last video, I said this one was gonna be about the cost estimation specification tool, but that'll probably only be about a 30 second video. So I'll run through it really quickly at the start, and then we'll move on to looking at using the Create Drill Holes tool. A large part of my job on site was creating life of mine conceptual drill designs that covered the next 18 months or so's worth of drilling to plan the budget and schedule to. It used to take me ages, largely because there was no real quick way to create lots of target points in a specific grid pattern and then draw the actual drill traces from the planned collar locations to those targets. So I had to manually draw each target point and each drill hole, then manually name them all, and the whole thing got a bit monotonous and time consuming. Especially when you fly back to site after break and the engineers had changed the mine design and you had to go back and spend a couple of days redoing a bunch of the design and renaming holes and all that fun stuff. If you get a scripting guru on site, you may have had some scripts that automate some of the process. But when I had a chance to work with our developers on some baked in tools for drill hole planning in Vulcan, I really wanted to try and provide automated tools for the whole process, or at least as much of it as possible. So let's jump into Vulcan and, and get stuck in. So obviously the first two videos in this series focused on how to create specification files to store our drill rig setup parameters and expected deviation rates. And we'll see how we use those in the Create Drill Holes tool in a later video when we focus on creating an underground production program. But for this life of mine conceptual design, uh, firstly, I'll quickly create a cost estimation spec file. Now, this is pretty simple. So let's make this. Something simple. Now I'm just gonna make the numbers up here, but let's say between zero and 100 meters, uh, it might cost me about I know, $120 per meter. And then from 100 to 200, it might cost me 125. 200 to 300, it might cost me 130. Uh, 300 to 500, it might cost me 135. And then anything up to 1,000 meters um, might cost me 140. And that's it. So we can save that. Now I've already covered how to create drill targets using the Create Drill Targets tool in a previous webinar I put together for the phase one drill hole planning release. So I'm not gonna look at that today. If you haven't seen that video, it's in the resources section of our website under webinars. So here's some targets I prepared earlier. We've got a decline in green and we've got some drill drives available for me to drill from in blue or light blue here. Yeah. So now we can fire up the Create Drill Holes tool. And I'll create a scenario. Now you can see we've got four different planning input types. Now, if you've got a bunch of color locations on the surface and just want to design some vertical holes, then you could use the collar and the hole layout planning input type. Uh, if you wanted to create some wedge holes from an existing parent, you could use the daughter hole input type, or like in this example, uh, we're gonna use the collar and the target planning input type, as that is our input that we have. Now the survey interval field allows me to find what intervals the tool will create survey points along the strings of the drill trace. So I'll just run with the default 20 meter values, uh, but you can set this to whatever spacing your camera surveys are at, or if you're gyroing down the hole, you can put it to the gyro interval as well. These planning constraints allow me a bit of control over how the holes are created. If I leave the planning constraints as the defaults, then if I'm creating multiple drill holes, it'll make the shortest holes it can. If I change the azimuth uh, or the dip planning constraints, then it'll pick the shortest hole that satisfies these constraints. And if it can't create a hole within these constraints, then it'll create the hole that gets as close as it can to meeting them. And in which case it will let you know and print some details to the Vulcan console for you to review. The setup optimization tolerance defines the tolerance in degrees for the optimization of the azimuth and dip at the collar when applying deviation to drill holes. We're not gonna apply deviation in this 
scenario. So I'm just going to roll with the defaults here. So now we can move on and pick our planning inputs. And because I'm using, I'm going to use line inputs here for my collar locations, I can set the spacing here uh, to determine at what intervals I want collars positioned uh, along that on those lines. So I'll pick 40 meters and then I can select my drill drives and I've got them grouped. So I will select by drill drive. You can see it pulls in, um, it automatically calculates collar locations for me down the drive, uh, displays the object names and pulls in the color from the object that I selected. And then I can pick my targets and I'll select by layer, pick my targets layer, and you can see it sucks all of those into the panel for me as well. Now it's probably worth noting uh, there is a digitize option uh, for each of these as well. So uh, probably not super useful for this conceptual life of mine sort of style planning, but if you're doing a small production um, or surface drilling program, and all you want to do is just kind of manually pick some collar locations and some target locations, uh, you can do that. And then there's some tools to be able to edit it later, which we'll get to in a different video. So next I can uh, decide how I want to name my drill holes. So for a production scenario, you could just define a simple base name, um, which you usually already have set up on site. But in this conceptual design, I'm going to use an expression to build um, a base name for me. So we can use this expression builder. Now I can pick from a bunch of the variables that I've pulled in from my collars uh, and my targets. So the first thing I might want to do is use my collar object name. Uh, and then I may want to separate that with an underscore. And then I may wish to use my target object domain. And then I might also want to have my target object group. So in this case, the collar object name is the drive that I'm going to be drilling from, the target object domain. So in this case would be TQ2. Uh, and then I've got my target object group. Now this will be RD or GC in my case. So I'm going to save that. Um, I will save this expression as a new expression. So I can save that and then it's available to pick later. I'm going to use this, use separate number sequences for each unique base name. Basically, that means anytime this changes for a hole. So when the conditions change, it will start a new number sequence. What this allows me to do basically is name my RD and my GC holes separately according to my base name expression that I'm using. I can set the starting number to whatever I like. In this case, because it's a conceptual one, I'll start at one and then I can determine how much zero padding I want. So because I know I'm going to make less than a thousand drill holes, uh, three is probably fine here. So this starting, uh, the, the like number sequence basically gets applied um, to the end of the base name. Then I can define my naming sequence. So I'm going to do column then row. My row sequence is going to be towards the strike direction uh, and my column sequence is going to be top down. Now I know when I created my drill targets, the strike I used was 65 and I'll use a minus 90 dip. You can digitize three points if you want uh, on the screen. And if you're doing so, the first two points determine the strike and then the third point determines the dip. So in this case, if we take a look at this image in the help, uh, this is using the exact same settings that um, I've picked. We're using column then row, we're going towards the strike direction and we're doing top down. So you can see, essentially we start in the column on the left and go top down and then we move along to the columns. So assume these are all drill hole names for different targets from uh, some holes that are drilled from the same collar. So the spacing value essentially determines the, the width of these columns. So in this case, one is fine because my drill holes are fairly tightly spaced and it works out nicely because I'm using an, an offset drill pattern as well from the targets. If you had a regular spaced grid and your holes are more widely spaced, you could probably uh, get away with using a larger number. You might just need to kind of play with it a bit till you get what you want. If we look at the second example here, this is also what I've done. So because I used line inputs to determine my collars, in this scenario, it'll use the 
color object name to determine how things are ordered. So let's assume these are three different colors along a drive input. It'll work its way down the drive and name everything for that drive first before moving to the next one. Kind of the way a drill rig would you know, work its way down the drive and then go to the next drive and drill from there. So once we've defined our naming convention, we can come to the Calculate Drill Traces panel and I can press Calculate. And just like that, you can see we've created 811 drill holes. You can use the Highlight Selected and the Zoom to select it if I want to hone in on a particular hole. You can see my drill holes have been named down the fans for me. Now, since this is a conceptual design, I'm not going to bother too much with changing any of the, you know, the collar locations or applying any deviation or, or anything like that. Uh, there are tools for that. We'll cover them in, in a different video. But in this case, I probably want to extend my drill holes. So I probably want to extend them 10 meters beyond the foot wall of my domain solid. So I can just apply that to all holes. Notice this max depth then updates. And if we have a look at our drill holes, you can see they've all been extended 10 meters beyond the foot wall of that triangulation. And you can extend them by a percentage of the total hole length if you wanted, or you could change the max depth. Now I applied to all the holes in one hit, but you could, if you wanted, use the apply to selection and you can just sort of select and shift click to select several rows in the grid and apply just to that selection if you want. And that's the, the same case with um, any of these edit options. Next thing I'm gonna do is I will use the cost estimator spec file that I made at the start to apply the estimated cost to those holes as well. So now we can decide how we want to save the drill holes. So in this case, because it's just a conceptual design, I'm going to save them all to a single layer and I'll call it um, conceptual holes. Now I could, if I wanted, um, split those to separate layers for each collar, but it's probably overkill in this case. I'll end up with a lot of layers, but you can do if you want. Um, we'll go through these other options again in a production video as they're a bit more um, relevant there, but you can export to CSV files. So in that case, it'll create a collar and a survey CSV file. The summary file is more production focused, essentially um, dumps out all the attribute fields uh, into a single CSV file for each drill hole. And we can save to a drill hole database as well if we want. But I'll just save to a layer, we'll save that. And I will close my panel. So now you can see we've got all our drill holes um, saved out to a layer for me. Now, if I open up my property editor, one thing that we can see straight away is if I select one of the drill holes, you can see all of these attributes get exported uh, as metadata on the holes. So it's really easy to come in and sort of see all the details for any of the drill holes as they've been exported. Now, that's all saved as metadata. Um, I will go through in a future video how we can use that metadata and what we can do with it to set visibility and um, bits and pieces and data tips and, and stuff. But this video is starting to get a bit long as it is. So I will just quickly though show you that we can right click on a hole, go to select by name. And because I have RD in my drill hole name, because I used that, I can use a star RD star, for example, to select all my RD holes and then do what I like with them. Um, similarly, I could, I could uh, exclude RD and select all of my GC holes, right? So, so a few different ways that we can utilize that but this video is starting to get a bit long so i'm 
mindful that I should probably call it here. Well, that's it for creating Life of Mine conceptual drill designs. In the next video, we'll take a look at creating an underground production drill design where we can make use of the spec files we made in the first two videos in the series to automatically adjust our collar positions to align with our drill rig setup specifications and apply some deviation to the hole. Cheers.